In problem 23, we are being asked to find the largest open intervals on which the function is concave upward or concave downward. So it's important to remember that anytime you are looking at concavity, you have to associate that with your second derivative being set equal to zero. So here is my original function. My first derivative would be negative 15x squared plus 2, and then when I take my second derivative, I get the negative 30x. If I set that equal to 0 and solve, then I have a possible inflection point of x equals 0. Now, I will make the number line just like I do with the first derivative to figure out my concavity. So here is my number line. Here is my partition at 0. Um, choose anything smaller than zero to plug in. I just happen to use negative one. And again, it's very important you're plugging it back into your second derivative. So when I plug negative one in, I get a positive 30. We don't care about the value. We just care about the fact it's positive. That makes my graph go co turn concave up on that interval. And then I chose something bigger than zero. I plugged in x equal one plugged it in, and I got an answer that was negative. So that would indicate the graph is concave down. So we say that the function is concave up from what we call negative infinity up to zero, and it does not include zero, so make sure you're putting parentheses like that, and that it's concave down starting at zero and then going to infinity. Okay, so then that does make x equals 0 a point of inflection anytime there's a change in concavity. And so in order to get the ordered pair for that point, you've got to make sure that you plug 0 back into the original function. And when I do that, I get a y value of 7. So my point of inflection is at 0, 7. 24, we're looking at critical numbers again. So remember that critical numbers are related to a first derivative being set equal to zero. Um, applying my power rule, when I take my first derivative, I get a seven times x minus two to the sixth. When I set that equal to zero and I solve, you eventually just are down to where x minus two is zero. And so you get a, a potential critical number of x is equal to two or you get a critical number, we don't necessarily know that uh, it's a max or a min until we actually look at the particular number line. So here is my number line with a partition at 2. I chose to plug in x equal 1. Again, go back to your first derivative when you're plugging in. So that answer ends up being positive. And then when I plugged in x equal 3 back into my first derivative, it's also a positive answer. So that means this graph is always increasing. And since there is no change from increasing to decreasing or vice versa, then um, the two there is not a local max or a local min. So 2 is a critical value, but we do not have, there is no local maximum or local minimum. And then finally... Or next, on question 25, we're doing implicit differentiation. Anytime you are deriving, pay attention to what is in the bottom. And so if it says dx on bottom, you're deriving everything with respect to x. So what that means is if you take a derivative and x is involved, you just derive it normally. So the derivative of 4x is just simply 4. But if you have another variable and it does not involve x, anytime you derive it, you've got to follow it by the derivative of that variable with respect to x. So in other words, when I take the derivative of the 7y here, the derivative is 7, but since y we don't know in terms of x, we have to follow it by the dy dx, which just means times the derivative of y with respect to x. And then, of course, the derivative of my 2 is 0. So once we do that, they're asking us to find what dy dx equals 2. So algebraically, you're just solving. So I subtracted 4 on both sides, and then I divided by 7. And so that's where I found that my dy dx is negative 4 over 7. And then finally, same thing on number 26. 
So again, notice when I took the derivative of 6x squared, I got just a plain 12x. When I take the derivative of negative 4y to the fourth, I get negative 16y, but then I follow it with dy dx. The derivative of 3x is simply 3, and then when I take the derivative of negative 4y, I get a negative 4, but I follow it by dy dx. So this time you've got two terms with dy dx, but they also gave you a point to plug in. You can plug in first and then find your dy dx, or you can get dy dx by itself and then plug in. I chose to go ahead and plug in first, thinking it would help some things simplify a lot quicker. So my x is zero, plug that in. My y is one, plug that in. And so yes, 12 times zero would be zero. That gets rid of that term. And so then I went ahead and I put the dy dx terms on the same side. Since this was subtracted, I added the plus four dy dx to both sides. Now the key at this step is since both terms have a dy dx, you wanna factor it out. Or, I'm sorry, you wanna combine the like terms, um, which is kinda of like factoring it out. So negative 16 plus four would be, leave me with negative 12 times your dy dx, and then I divided both sides by negative 12. Make sure if you can reduce that you do so. So three over negative 12 reduces to a negative one fourth.